Welcome to Just Asia, AHRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Reading of Hong Kong's extradition law postponed due to angry protests. UN experts call for international inquiry into staggering killings in the Philippines. Indonesian rights groups call for further investigation in the death of eight protesters. Vietnamese activists sentenced to six years imprisonment under new law. Thai lawyers group concerned at continued violence against activists. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia. I'm Nola. This week, Just Asia begins with Hong Kong, where protests are continuing over the government's proposed extradition bill. Thousands gathered outside the Legislative Council headquarters on Wednesday, where the bill was meant to be discussed for the second time. The reading was postponed as legislative councillors were unable to make it through the crowds. While the protests began peacefully towards the latter part of the day, police resorted to using tear gas, rubber bullets and pepper spray to keep protesters away from parliament headquarters. As of 10 p.m. on Wednesday, the hospital authority reported that 72 persons were injured with two in critical conditions. Amnesty International, Hong Kong, and the Civil Human Rights Front are among those condemning the police's use of excessive violence against protesters. Hong Kong's government first proposed legal amendments in February to allow the city to handle case-by-case -case extradition requests from jurisdictions with no prior agreements, most notably China and Taiwan. The plan would enable the chief executive and local courts to handle extradition requests without legislative oversight. Critics fear that the law will allow China to extradite and punish persons under a legal system with no human rights safeguards. There has thus been protest against the bill from all sides lawyers, businesses, journalists and ordinary Hong Kongers. Many businesses from accounting firms to grocery shops and hotels allowed employees to attend the protest on Wednesday. Similarly, many high school and university students banked classes to attend the protest. Over a million protesters had marched against the bill on Sunday and the largest protest seen in the city since 1997. If this bill passed, uh, Hong Kong wouldn't be Hong Kong anymore. Because Hong Kong, for the very long time in history, we have rule of law. Uh, we have our freedom, but this bill destroys them because this bill allows the governments to extradite Hong Kong people and send them back to mainland China for trial. And this is very dangerous and it threatens our personal safety because Hong Kong people just don't trust the Chinese legal system. That we've seen uh, for the, uh, in the past, so many cases, uh, those who are accused uh, of a criminal offense in mainland China, they don't get a fair trial, not even an open trial. They got detained for months and years without uh, being trialed, and they are not represented by lawyers, and they disappear, and they died in jail. So uh, how could all this happen to Hong Kong? How can the government just connect our Hong Kong's judicial system to that one, to, to that in mainland China? So this is putting us like a normal Chinese city, destroying our rule of law, destroying our human rights protection, destroying our freedom. That is right, the extradition bill proposed by the government in Hong Kong, it doesn't affect only the local people, or only the Hong Konger. It affects all the people uh, who are physically in Hong Kong, those visitors, those who are on holiday, those who have investments here, business people, expats, uh, because uh, it's about catching them physically if uh, once they are found, found suspected. So all the uh, nationals of other countries, they are affected, they are the stakeholders. I, I think that's the reason why uh, so many countries have voiced out uh, about their concerns and their disagreement with the Hong Kong government's proposed uh, extradition bill. I would like to tell the international community that uh, firstly, the extradition bill is about human rights. It's about using the extradition power to violate Hong Kong's human rights. So this is a universal issue, universal value. 
I wish that the inter international community would really speak up for us people. Second, it's also about their own interests. So many people have, uh, so many government and their nationals have investments in Hong Kong. Their headquarters, huge investments, a uh, big part of their GDP, their economy. So if the freedom in, in Hong Kong is eroding, eroding, and now it's eroded. So uh, doing business in Hong Kong won't be safe anymore. And one day uh, they will end up be involved in Chinese politics and be extradited and disappear somewhere, end up in mainland China. So uh, to protect their own interests, they also need to speak up for us. Moving to the Philippines, a group of United Nations human rights experts is calling for an international inquiry into the staggering number of unlawful killings under President Duterte. Prior to the session of the Human Rights Council this month, 11 UN special reporters have made a statement condemning the violence and intimidation practiced by Duterte's government and the prevailing climate of official impunity. The joint statement made last Friday seeks to galvanize international action in the Human Rights Council. We have recorded a staggering number of unlawful deaths and police killings in the context of the so-called war on drugs, as well as killings of human rights defenders, the experts said. While Philippine authorities have said that more than 5,000 people have been killed in the president's war on drugs since 2016, the country's Human Rights Com Commission believes the number may be closer to 27,000. According to Carlos Gonde, a Philippine researcher for Human Rights Watch, the killings continue on a daily basis with practically zero accountability. Aside from drug-related killings, the joint statement cited extrajudicial killings and summary killings of children, people with disabilities, indigenous people, trade union representatives and land rights activists. The experts also drew attention to accusations of arbitrary detention, torture and inhuman or degrading treatment, violence against women and attacks on the independence of judges and lawyers, freedom of expression and assembly, as well as people's rights to food and health. In Indonesia, several national human rights groups in the country conducted an investigation into the violence and excessive use of force by the police during the massive public protest on May 22nd in Jakarta. The investigation found that police committed a number of human rights violations when forcibly dispersing the protest against alleged election fraud. Four persons detained by the police have claimed they were tortured by the police. Family members of several persons arrested by the police were not allowed to meet with the detainees. Furthermore, no legal aid was given to the detainees. Although a public lawyer appointed by the police accompanied the protesters, the lawyers did not provide legal assistance during the examination processes at the police office. Family members also reported that when minors were being examined, there was no notification sent to the parents. The investigation was conducted by Jakarta Legal Aid, Press Legal Aid and Contrast, among other organizations. The group have noted that the death of eight protesters needs further investigation. They have also recommended that Indonesia's Ombudsman, National Commissions on Human Rights and Victims and Witnesses Protection Agency should actively monitor the progress of the case and make sure that the police respect the rule of law and due process. Next, in Vietnam, an environmental activist has been sentenced to six years imprisonment under a new cyber security law. The European Union has called the sentence a breach of Vietnam's international human rights agreements. Nguyen Ngoc An, a 39-year-old shrimp farmer from the southern town of Bindai, was arrested and tried for what state media described as making storing, releasing and circulating information and documents against the state. According to Human Rights Watch, Nguyen took part in environmental protests against Formosa Plastics Group, 
a Taiwanese steel company that admitted to being responsible for an environmental disaster in 2016. Nguyen also publicly boycotted the national election in May 2016 and repeatedly voiced support for Vietnam's political prisoners. Vietnam's new cybersecurity law came into effect in January and has seen several bloggers and activists detained under it. Described by activists as Stalinist, the law criminalizes criticism of the government and forces internet companies to store data and hand over user information without a warrant. <music> Lastly, Thailand continues to see intimidation against political activists. In the most recent case, democracy activist Sirawith Seritiwat was attacked on June 2nd after launching a campaign against voting for Prime Minister. On May 13th, Aikashai Hongkakwan was violently attacked in front of the Bangkok Criminal Court after attending a hearing on the case against activists protesting for elections. Since early 2018, Aikashai has been physically assaulted seven times while his car was set on fire twice. Similarly, Anurag Dentamanesh was subjected to two physical attacks this year, the latest of which took place on May 25th while he was going to demonstrate at the temporary parliament building. A joint statement issued by the Thai Lawyers for Human Rights and other concerned organizations condemns the rise of intimidation against political activists throughout the past five years under military rule. The statement further notes that there have been hardly any proper investigations into this intimidation, with no one brought to justice. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and on other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia/justasia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.